I was thinking for a long time that I would share a little bit on Romans and I'll share a tiny bit on Romans today. Uh, but as I was just meditating earlier in the week, I just felt like I needed to share uh, something that I've just recently been teaching in church and kind of do a mini version of it. But I had actually thought about this for a few months before I taught on it. And I'm going to kind of put all together what I've done. And it's all on the website. On our website, too, we have literally hundreds of hours of teaching. It's downloadable, audio, downloadable, video, and we've made it all free. So uh, you can go and just, we got people just all the time connecting. I mean, I had people this week on there from Indonesia and Africa, Madagascar. I mean, it just, China downloaded our children's curriculum the other day. And uh, I think they block stuff in China, but I was super excited when I saw it went into China. And it just Myanmar, I mean, just Italy, Germany. I mean, just, you, I mean, just exploding. South America, Mexico, Canada, all over the United States. The word is going out, amen? And we're, uh, we're getting the word out. And the word changes people. It's the word of God that I heard. You know, that first night that I went to Andrew's Bible study when I was only 14 years old, you know, Andrew then led worship with a 12 string guitar. And when he got done, he plugged in this mic to this Morantz cassette deck, this single cassette deck, started it recording. He held his Bible just like this. And, and I was born again, not baptized in the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit spoke up on the inside of me and said, listen to this man. He knows what he's talking about. And I've been listening for 46 years. And the message that I've heard and the revelation that I've received has revolutionized my life. And I'm just telling you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. And I'm, I'm believing God today for more than I've ever believed God for before. And I'm telling you, it's coming to pass. Amen. I am not stopping here. Praise God. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're uh, looking at Karis Bible College. Amen. So I'm going to talk about surrender. If you know how good it would be, you never would have waited. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to talk about identifying with Jesus. Now, when we talk about identification with Jesus, Paul in his letters talks about seven principles of identification. Number one, we were crucified with Christ. Number two, we died with Christ. Number three, we were buried with Christ. Number four, we were made alive with Christ. Number five, we were raised with Christ. Number six, we're seated with Christ. And number seven, we reign with Jesus Christ. Of those principles, Three of them are paramount, and those are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to talk just a little bit today about identifying with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that, what that means to us as believers. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. He says, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received of the Lord. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised again according to the scriptures. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the heart of the gospel. And if you get a revelation of not only what happened physically, but how you identify that and what, with that and what that means in your life, it's going to change your life for good. So the first thing we're going to talk about really briefly is what does it mean to identify with Christ in his death? You see, because if you never identify with Jesus in his death, you're never going to really identify with him in his life. Paul says in Romans 8, 17, if we suffer with him, right, we're going to also be glorified together. Now, Greg Moore preached a great message on we're called to suffering, right? And before he ever started, I said, well, number one, it's the flesh. And number two, it's persecution. 
And then he preached on number one, persecution, and number two, the flesh. But if you never identify with Jesus in his suffering, if you never identify with his death, you're never going to really see the power of his life. I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bible, to Matthew chapter 16. I want to read two verses here, Matthew 16, verse 24 and verse 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, if you identify with Jesus at the cross, now when Luke talks about that, he says you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him daily. So this isn't something that just happens once in your Christian walk. This is something that needs to be a continual surrender. Everybody say surrender. If you knew how good it would be, you never would wait. You would completely surrender to Jesus. Now, how, how do we surrender to Jesus? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to make a decision. It amazes me how many people today are not really willing to make a decision. You need to make a decision to surrender yourself to the Lordship and the dominion of Jesus Christ. The best decision that you'll ever make is a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and your personal Savior. I'm not just talking about a head understanding of the gospel. I'm talking about a heart revelation of the gospel where you really understand the Lordship and the dominion of Jesus Christ. And when you get a, an understanding of that, it, and when you really do it in your life, it's going to change your life. You know, Paul actually in Romans chapter 10 quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30. And he said, we don't have to go somewhere high up to get him down. And we don't have to go to the grave to get him up. The will of God's not across the sea. Right? He says, the word is in you. Romans chapter uh, 10 in verse 8. That is in your heart and in your mouth. That is the word of faith that we preach. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, in verse 10, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is not a magic formula. What Paul is actually saying, if you read verse 6 and 7, he's quoting Deuteronomy. And what he's saying is we don't have to get somebody to go up to heaven to bring God down. God already came down in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came from heaven and he lived on this earth a sinless, holy, perfect, and pure life. And he died on the cross for our sins. He went to the grave. We don't have to go down to the grave to get God up. Listen, you don't have to pray God down from heaven and you don't have to bind every devil in hell because Jesus already came from heaven and he already brought heaven to earth and he lived on this earth sinless, holy, perfect, and pure and he died on the cross for our sins and he went to the grave and he conquered the devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he rose from the dead victorious. And what he did was he put the ball in our court. And he said, now it's your choice. The word is in your heart and in your mouth. That is the word of faith. Yes, Pastor Lawson Purdue is a word of faith preacher. That we preach. I'm also a word of grace preacher. He says that the word of faith that we preach, and, he, and what he's saying, if you confess with your mouth. Now, why do you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord? 
You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord because you believe with your heart. You hear the gospel. You hear what God did in Christ when he came and when he died and when he rose again. And you believe that God made Jesus Lord when he raised him from the dead. So then you're going to say Jesus is Lord. You can't get me not to confess that Jesus is Lord. 2016, the city of Colorado Springs tried to get me not to confess that Jesus is Lord. They tried to take down my bus benches that I've been having up for over three years. Jesus is Lord. They said that is a, what they say, that is a hate speech. Well, I told them in no uncertain terms. Amen. But I had been putting those advertisements up using the name of Jesus. They said using the name of Jesus is eight feet for the last three years and I intended to continue to do it. And if they wanted to meet me in the Supreme Court, they could. And it didn't take them very long to back down. Glory to God. Jesus is Lord. So, so we don't say Jesus is Lord to make him Lord. God made him Lord when he raised him from the dead. And because I believe the gospel, I'm going to speak the gospel. Because I believe in what Jesus did, I'm going to say some things. Amen. Hallelujah. So number one, you make a decision to follow Jesus, right? Surrender your life to Jesus. Number two, you make a decision to surrender your life, your thoughts, your ways, and your plans to God's life and God's thoughts and God's ways and God's plans. You know why? Because God's plan for you is better than your plan for you any day of the week. I'm going to tell you a little story. I, I got married when I was just 19 years old. And Barbara, she, she graduated from college, right? May 12th, 1984. And we got married on May 19th, 1984. 40 years ago. Praise God, we're celebrating 40 years this year. So we're celebrating a lot. Hallelujah. I'm rejoicing. But, but anyway, you know, before she graduated, she was going to horse training and management college. I say, that's why she does so good with me. <laughs> and and uh, they wanted her to write a plan about what she was going to do in her horse training and management business. And I was raised in the horse business. My grandfather had a horse business. So we wrote up this plan about how we're going to, you know, have this horse business. And, and then we had another plan that we kind of had in our own mind, how we were going to fly, you know, we were going to manage this business and run this horse business and, 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 and then travel around the world while we managed this horse business. Guess what? That was our plan, but that was not God's plan. And God's plan for you is better than your plan for you any day of the week. Amen. We have our plans, right? But God has his plan. And you need to surrender to God's plan. You need to surrender to God's thoughts. You need to surrender. And so, you know what? Just a short period of time after we got married, God you know, moved on us and called us to go that to, to, Andrew didn't have a Bible school then, to Dr. Lester Summerall's Bible school that at that point in time was called World Harvest Bible College. And we left the ranch behind. We left everything behind and we went to Bible school. I remember we felt like we were Abraham and Sarah. We had all of our goods in this moving truck in our car behind little Aaron was just seven months old and we drove out there. You know, now we got to South Bend, Indiana and we were ready to go to Bible school, but we were there a little bit ahead of Bible school. And so we had to find a house to rent. So we ended up living in Mr. Gilmer's house in Gilmer Park, where Mr. Gilmer lived with the Indian bride. That's what the neighbors told us. And I mean, it was a shack, like 600 square foot shack. The toilet didn't even work. The neighbors opened up their back porch because they had a toilet on their back porch. So we could use the toilet on the neighbor's back porch. This house had one furnace, you know, South Bend, Indiana, right up there close to Chicago, you know, right south of Lake Michigan where they get all the lake effect. It's, 
miserable experience when you're from Colorado. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, you know, it had one heater without a fan in the middle of the house. We have this little mini oven and Barbara's, a, she's really good at cooking chocolate chip cookies. So, but you know, we had to light it. It was a gas oven. You had to light it with a match. So when the house needed warmed up, we'd fire up the oven, <laughs> warm up the house. But, 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 you know, we lived in, in Gilmer Park on Gilmer Street in this, in this little shack built in the 1800s where Mr. Gilmer lived, we were told, with the Indian bride. <laughs> And we had these great ideas, you know, like Abraham and Sarah living by faith. And then, you know, we graduated from Bible school and we were moving back to Kit Carson. And, and you know, Kit Carson, man, there's, there's probably, you know, there wasn't, any, there, there wasn't any houses for sale for a while. And you can count the good houses in Kit Carson on both hands, probably. I, I mean, there's, there's not a lot of good houses in Kit Carson. Anyway, anyway it, it, we're going back and they said, well, you can live in this trailer house out in the country. Uh, that a guy has, or you can live in low-income housing. So we chose to live in low-income housing. Amen? And so we started out in low-income housing, and, and, you know, supernaturally God revealed to us what to do, and we, we were building a church. My first office was in a tin shed by the right close, to, we live right down the street from Carrie's trailer house. If you saw where Carrie came from, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I know where the girl came from. And Greg Moore, he, he visited her when she was in a, a little nicer area of Russia. But I remember when she started out in Murmansk and the person that went with her quit in the middle of the year and she was running a Bible school and she emailed me and said, what do I do? I said, you need to stay and finish the year for the students. Good things happen when you stay the course. Hallelujah. So Carrie, listen to what I told her. That, that was a lot worse than where uh, Greg saw in St. Petersburg. Right? What was that before it was St. It was Leningrad before it was St. Petersburg. <laughs> but praise God, Carrie's was just right. But my, my first office was this tin shed by the railroad tracks. And, and this guy owned this elevator and it used, it was the old office. And I went and swept out the cobwebs and painted the thing up. It did have running water. They told me they'd give me a telephone. I said, no, nah, I just use the phone at my house. I like to keep expenses low. Praise God. How <laughs> I've had to break out of that a little bit. <laughs> I'm really having to break out of now. Hallelujah. My, my staff bills about, uh, woo, a lot of money. Hallelujah. <laughs> Nothing like Andrew's staff bill. Praise God. <laughs> but by the grace of God, he pays his bill. And by the grace of God, I pay my bill. Amen. But God helps us. Glory to God. But that's where we started out. And, and Aaron actually has pictures of it. And he, he tells some of my staff sometime. You know, you guys got it really good. Look where my dad started. Praise God. But then in a little bit, God opened the door and God gave us a house and God blessed us. But you know, God's plan for you is better than your plan for you any day of the week. But you know, not long after I started pastoring, you know, I had worked for, for my grandfather for years. My dad had worked for my grandfather. My grandparents had always told my dad that they were going to give my dad the ranch. But my dad had died. My dad went home to be with Jesus. And not long after I started pastoring, they decided to take me out of the will. And one of the most painful things that I dealt with. Now, God helped me deal with it. It took me a while. Amen. But because I made a decision to go into the ministry. You see, because my grandparents had told me when I was 17 years old after my dad died, if you will stay here and run this ranch, we'll give this to you. Well, there was a problem with that. I said, you know, God's called me to preach and I don't know where God's gonna call me to go, so I can't promise you that I'm gonna stay here and run this ranch. So my inheritance was actually given to my cousin. And it's a little bit painful to deal with, but God helped me. Amen. I got over it. Amen. But that's, that's what I'm talking about is the cross. What I'm talking about is if you die, Jesus says this in Matthew 16, verse 25, whoever will say, whoever's going to hold on to his natural, carnal, soulish life is going to lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake in the gospels, He's going to gain eternal life, right? And 
Jesus said what? You're going to get a hundredfold. Amen. In this life with, Andrew always tells people, with persecutions. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. Amen? So we started out. When we started out pastoring, we, we didn't make a lot of money. We lived in low-income housing. Now, did you know what? We started in the cattle business and different things. And God blessed us and God helped us tremendously. But it wasn't always real easy. And so, you know, while we were in Kit Carson, God blessed us, God helped us. I had a mentor there. My mentor had an eighth, eighth grade education. When I came to Kit Carson, he didn't have very much net worth. He had actually been in a divorce and he had given almost all of his wealth to his kids to keep it out of the divorce. But when we moved to town, he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He got excited about giving. He started sowing. And he, guess what? When you start doing that, God starts blessing you. He went home to be with the Lord in the last couple of years. And he was, he was telling me before he did, I'm having a really hard time keeping my net worth under $10 million. But he was buying six square miles, about 14 miles north of Kit Carson. He wanted to sell me a section. That's a square mile right in the middle of this, 640 acres. I went out and drove my little Ford pickup around it. I wanted to buy it so bad. And I would know, I knew that it, I just knew it would make money. And usually when I know something will make money, it'll make money. And I drove back to the church and I remember driving up to the back of the church, my little Ford pickup, and I remember my little body just shaking because I wanted to do it. But God said, no. Now, guess what? If I'd have bought that ranch, if I'd have bought that land, I probably wouldn't be in Colorado Springs. I wouldn't probably be on this stage right now doing what I'm doing. And it probably would have greatly limited and hindered God's plan for my life. Now, there's a lot of things that God has allowed me to do, but there's some that God says no. And when God says no, God means no. And in Isaiah 55, I want you to just turn there really quick. It says this. He says in verse six, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let him, the unrighteous man, his thoughts and let him return to the Lord for he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In verse 11, he says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish that which I please. Look at three results of the word and it will prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Notice verse 12 and 13, for you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into singing and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn will come up the, the fir tree. Instead of the briar will come up the myrtle tree and it will be to the Lord. In other words, if you'll learn to let go of your thoughts, your plans, your ways, your ideas, your direct, and get a hold of God's thoughts and God's plans and God's ways and God's ideas, you're going to have a good end. It's going to cause joy. It's going to cause rejoicing. There's going to be good fruit come when you release that which you have and surrender and give it to Jesus. He says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I mean, there's going to be a good end. So don't be afraid of identifying with Jesus in the cross. And then after we were at Kit Carson for 13 years, God, you know, actually worked on us for a couple of years before we left about making change. And then it took us a while to get real clarity and real direction about making that change. And I remember when we came to Colorado Springs and we started Caris Christian Center at the direction. I remember talking to Andrew about it. Andrew came and ministered at my church in April of uh, 2000. And I remember I went and borrowed money and I gave him an offering and Andrew took my envelope and I had a note in there and, and, he, and it was all sealed and he put it in his pocket. He never even looked in it. 
but I went and borrowed a significant amount of money personally and gave Andrew an offering. He put it in his pocket and he said, now I want you to go with me to Charlotte, North Carolina. He was going to hold meetings there in September. So I remember going with Andrew. I remember walking to the meetings. One night we were walking, I think it was Wednesday night to the meeting. And as I was talking to Andrew, I said, Andrew, we've had thoughts about coming to Colorado Springs and, and starting a church, but you know, we really don't know. And he said, I think that would be good for you. He said, I think that would be good. He says, there's not a lot of people really preaching the word and, and there's nobody like you. Amen. Now, how many of you know it's good to hear from Andrew, but it's better to hear from God. Amen. And even though Andrew had spoken to me, the Holy Spirit had not spoken to me and God had not spoken to me. But January 4th, 2001, I was sitting in my office in Kit Carson before noon and I was just sitting there meditating or thinking or praying. And as I was sitting there, the Lord dropped it in my spirit. He said, go to Colorado Springs and start a church, Caris Christensen. I thought, well, that's God. I went home and told Barbara, she said, I've been telling you for two years we need to do something in Colorado Springs. God was preparing her because she knew when God spoke to me, it was gonna be go. So I called Andrew on January 7th on Sunday in the afternoon and he said, that's God, you need to do it. Yeah. Amen. Then on Monday, I called the largest church in Colorado Springs, set up a meeting with the pastor on, for, for that Thursday, a week after God spoke to me and I went with and met with this pastor and praise God, he, he just gave me some really good wisdom, spoke the word of God to me. But I remember after we started, I mean, there were some weeks I put $50 in the offering. We were not receiving anything back, right? And the, the total church offering on some Sundays was less than $100. And I put 50 in. How many of you know that looks bleak? I remember walking by the dog food store and they had a sign out. Back then, minimum wage was $5 an hour. They'd pay you $9 an hour, but you had to work the midnight shift from midnight to 8 a.m. in the morning. I remember thinking, you know what? Whatever I'm going to do, my kids aren't going to go hungry. And if I have to go carry dog food in the night for $9 an hour, I'm going to go carry dog food, but my family is not going to suffer because of decisions that I made to follow God. Some people have that wrong. And then, you know, I started out, I didn't have, hardly had any money. Hardly had any, <laughs> I started handing out flyers and I could, I could make flyers at Office Depot on, on a kind of cream colored paper, paper, black ink for three and a half cents a piece. So I handed out 10,000 of those flyers. I handed out a hundred a day before we started the church. You know, we, we all already had a Bible study, but before we started and we started the day before 9-11. It might have been two days before if I look back at the calendar. But we started the Sunday before 9-11. And I remember after I had handed out 10,000 flyers and I'd already been having a Bible study for six months that we had 20 people involved. I remember how difficult it was in the beginning. But when you surrender. But I remember one day as I was handing out these flyers, this man, he stopped me in a pickup truck. He said, hey, what are you doing? He, he said, would you, you want to go to work for me? Because I get up in the morning, I'd pray, read my Bible. If I had to go to Bible school, I'd go to Bible school. I only taught four times a year then. Not, not four classes, four hours per year. So I, I remember, you know, that, that I, as I was handing out these flyers, this man drove up and he said, would you like to go to work for me? I said, well, that depends. He said, on what? I said, on whether I make it or not. He said, he, he just looked at me, said, oh, you're going to make it. And he drove off <laughs> because he could probably tell in the, in the way that I was going about doing what I was doing. Because when you have a purpose from God, you don't just act like the rest of the people, right? You, you're moving into something. I remember talking to Andrew and Andrew said, listen, Lawson, God called you here and God's going to provide for you. And listen, he's done way, 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 way more than just provide for me. He's provided for me in grand style. It's literally amazing what God has done for me and done for my family and done for my church. Praise God. But it all starts with surrender. Identify with the cross. The second thing that we need to identify with is we need to identify with the burial, right, of Jesus Christ. Not only his death, but his burial. What does it mean? 
to identify with Jesus in his burial. Did you know what? I've been preaching for over 40 years. And until just a couple of weeks ago, I had never preached a message about identifying with Jesus in his burial. What does that mean? Turn with me really quickly to Romans chapter 6. Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 5. Look at what Paul says. He says in Romans 6, verse 4 and 5, he says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should also walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. It talks about being planted together. Guess what? When you're planted together, something happens when a seed is buried. Did you know when a seed is buried, it goes down one way, but it comes up another way. It gets a new identity. So we need to understand we're dead to sin. We're alive to righteousness. We've got a new identity. Paul talks about the resurrection of the physical body and says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 43. He says, it was sown in weakness. It was raised in power. He talks also in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 14. And he says, we were buried with him by baptism and now we're raised with him through faith in the operation of God. He goes on to say in verse 14 that he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, nailing it to his cross. Praise God. Taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And then he says in verse 15 that having spoiled principles and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. And when you begin to understand what happens in identity, when you, when you quit identifying with sin and start identifying with righteousness, when you quit identifying with weakness and start identifying with power, there's something that happened. Because what really gave Satan dominion in your life was sin. That's what happened in the garden. But what gives you dominion and authority over the devil is the fact that you've been justified by his blood. You've been justified by faith. You've been made righteous. You've been sanctified. You are a new creation in Christ. We've been to understand that you have authority over the devil. What gives you authority over the devil is that you are forgiven, right? And you're forgiven to such an extent, it's like it's never, you were pardoned as if your sin was never even committed. And when you begin to understand that, that leads you into authority. But what happens when a seed is buried? Turn with me to John chapter 12. Let's look at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, verse 24 and verse 25, Jesus says this. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he's talking about his own death, his own what's going to happen with him, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Then he says the same thing. He who loves his life shall lose it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. When you identify with Christ in his burial, what you do is you relinquish control. When someone is buried, they have no control, right? It's over, right? It's done. In other words, I don't belong to me anymore. Paul says, I have been bought with a price. Therefore, he says, or we have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Not only is your spirit the property of God, bought with the blood of Jesus, your body is the property of God, and it's been bought with the blood of Jesus. But when you begin to understand this principle of identifying with Christ in his burial, you surrender. You, you relinquish control. You, you don't say, I don't belong to me anymore. I belong to Jesus. This isn't my deal. This is your deal, Jesus. You, I didn't get into this on my own and I'm not going to get out of it on my own. Amen. You didn't bring us here to leave us in other words. <laughs> You're going to bring us in that you can bring us out. Amen. Or bring us out that you can bring us in. That's what it says actually. Talking about Egypt. Amen. 
So we identify with Christ in his, bear, in his death. And when we identify with Christ in his death, that releases the treasure of Christ in you. That releases the life of God. But when you identify with his burial, you relinquish control. As long as a seed is not planted, it can sit there. It's doing nothing. But when it's planted, it changes identity. It changes form. But when it comes back up, it multiplies. That releases the power of multiplication. Glory to God. But the third thing is not only do we identify with Christ in his death, we identify with Christ in his burial, but we identify with Christ in his resurrection. Now turn with me to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two, and I'm gonna read it very quickly. I'm give, I preach this in three messages, so I'm trying to give you the mini version to that. But Ephesians chapter two says this in verse one, and you hath he quickened. You hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. I'm going to talk about seven things that identifying with Christ in his resurrection releases in you. Number one is new life. You hath he made alive. You hath he quickened. First John chapter five, verse 11 and 12, somewhere around there says he that has the son has life and he that has not the son has not life. When it's talking about life, the Greek word that's used is zoe. You got the very character and the nature of Jesus in you. You've got the life of God in you. You've got the quickening power of God in you. You hath he quickened. Where in time past, before you got saved, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and you were by, he says, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You came by sin honestly before you got saved. Among whom we had our conversation, our lifestyle, our behavior, our way of living, our citizenship in times past, in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of your flesh and of your mind, and you were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, not only did I get new life, but I got a brand new nature in Christ. I love what Paul says in Colossians chapter three, verse one through four. He says this, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Do not set your affection on things of the earth, but on things above, for you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we got a brand new nature. He, he says we were by nature children of wrath, these and others, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love where he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us live, look at this word, together. Together, Paul says that a number of times. Together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. Verse six says this, and he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Not only do we have new life, a brand new nature, the nature of God himself, the life of God himself, the righteous nature, a sanctified nature, a holy nature, a blessed nature, a nature of authority, a healed nature, amen? We got a brand new nature. You got the life of God in you. You got the DNA in you of Jesus. You got the same spirit that raised up Jesus living on the inside of you. If Christ be in you, Paul says in Romans 8, 10, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. You got a new nature. But not only got a new nature, you got a new position. You've, you've been raised up and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many of you are glad you got a new position in Christ? You're not just some old worm. You're just not some little old weak, sick, poor thing. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. He says this, that in the ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We've got new hope. Thank God for grace, amazing grace. Do you know Paul says that God saved us and called us with a holy calling before the foundation of the world. There was grace for your life before the foundation of the world. Amen? Amen. Jesus was the embodiment of grace. He was the word made flesh. 
When you got saved, you received the grace of God. He says that in verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. He tells us now we're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But this tells us there's going to be grace throughout eternity for us. Thank God for amazing grace. But we have, Paul says, if in this life we have hope in Christ, talking about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, we are of all men most miserable. I thank God there's something beyond this life. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? I can hear him shouting. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thank God we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We got a brand new system. He goes on to say in verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Paul says in Romans 4, 25, he says, for he was delivered for our offenses, but raised again for our justification. And Romans chapter five, verse one and two and eight through 11, you can see what that new system of grace and faith releases to you. Finally, he says, not only that, but we got brand new faith in Jesus. This faith is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. I love Galatians 2.20. It fits this all together. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who, it's the faith of Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Finally, he says this. We're a brand new creation in Christ. And he says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before, before the foundation of the world has ordained. God had a plan for your life before the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, and I'll finish it up with this right here to verse 21. He says, therefore, if any man, if any person be in Christ, the same has become a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself and given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ, not imputing the trespasses of the world unto them. This is the message then that we are sharing with you. And now we beseech you and Christ beseech you. Be reconciled to God for we are ambassadors for Christ. And finally he says in verse 21, he says, for God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, who never experienced sin. You see, the only sin that Jesus really ever had was our sin. And the only righteousness that we'll ever really have is the righteousness of Jesus. It's an exchange. God made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Surrender. If you only knew how good it would be, you never would have waited. God bless you. We love you.